Hey, everybody. Today I'm here with Sophie Watson, who I've been very excited to talk to and kind of wanted to talk to for a while now. I've been following her on Twitter, which we were just talking about Twitter as this interesting outlet for um, women in our position. So, Sophie, thanks for coming and talking with me. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's lovely to be here. Wonderful. Virtually. Yeah, virtually. It's nice to virtually meet you. <laughs> That's what I like to say. Um, so can you just start us off by just, you know, introduce yourself to people, tell tell us sort of what you're about, what you do? Sure, yeah. Um, well, as you said, my name's Sophie Watson. Um, I'm a final year psychology student at Cambridge at Newnham College. Um, and I'm also the co-president of the Cambridge Radical Feminist Network, um, which is sort of about 80% of my personality at the moment um, and taking about 80% of my time which is which is great given that I'm in my final year of my degree but yeah so worth it honestly um I suppose I've been I've been involved with the feminism for the last few months but then also with kind of issues around free speech and campaigning for that as a student and um so that's kind of the intersection of my interests there I suppose and did you know when you first started university that those would be your interests or was it something else back when you started? Um, God, I think back when I started, my, my interest was just my degree. I was, I was obsessed with psychology um, and I still am obviously in love with it. Um, and I didn't really think that I'd be in a position where I had to talk that much about feminism or free speech because obviously it was it was 2018 that I matriculated and um, I don't think I was particularly naive about the world but I didn't think that I'd have to be arguing in principle for a right to freedom of speech and its necessity in practice and I didn't really think I'd have to be having quite as many conversations as I do have to have about why about why it's important that women be recognized as a sex class um, but there you go that's how things have turned out. <laughs> Right. It's I think a lot of us are in that place, right, where we're like, I also didn't think I would have to talk about, you know, what what a woman is or um, or why free speech matters. It's kind of surprising, especially to look around and see the people who I thought my whole life were also super progressive and super open minded and interested in these lofty ideals of um, liberty and free speech. And, you know, even when you hate what you hear. Um, to see that they are the ones I have to convince of these most basic one-on-one concepts. Um, yeah. So, but, yeah, go ahead. Just, I mean, Margaret Atwood was a bit of a bit of a blow, I have to say. Um, right. Philip Pullman, Stephen yeah. King, they were all, um, I, I mean, I could go on, but it's all, it, it's exhausting, isn't it? I think yeah. it's just so frustrating that we have to be talking about this because it's not as if um, there are, it's not as if the fight's been won on... Um, right on sort of actual feminist issues that affect women um, or and it's not as if there aren't kind of um, other serious issues with free speech particularly in kind of other countries and sort of under more authoritarian regimes and we have to deal with cancel culture and and arguing about what a woman is and when it's been in the dictionary forever so right. it's, it's just frustrating but yeah I'm glad to have met so many like wonderful women who and people actually who are equally frustrated and equally committed to to doing this yeah it really helps um so did the first three years of your college experience kind of pass without incident were or were there were there contentious things there or you know how how did that first go <laughs> um to be honest I think I very much just kept my head down um and there were tensions um, maybe building throughout the first couple of years of my degree um, and for a little bit of time before that because I mean obviously I, I grew up on the internet I grew up on on Tumblr and in online spaces where the idea that trans women are women in a literal sense and that trans men are men etc is really normalized um, so I had my pronouns in my like Tumblr bio when I was 15 okay, um, yeah. and then I got a little bit of life experience between that and coming to Cambridge and I got to Cambridge and suddenly all of my supervisors had their pronouns in their email sign-offs and in their Twitter bios and things. Um, so it was, 
it was really odd how I, I, I'd kind of been moving away from these kind of ideologies and modes of political discourse gradually for a while. Um, and it was as if the rest of the world had gone in completely the opposite direction. Right. And then what about your like peers? How about, how were they with that stuff? Were there conversations happening? Um, I think not really, to be honest. Um, I, I have a friend um, because I was diagnosed with autism a few years ago and I have, um, I met, and there are lots of autistic people at Cambridge. I think for some reason um, we all kind of get attracted to this place. Um, so I was a little bit involved in kind of autism advocacy and stuff. Um, and I had, I did that with one of my close friends, um, who's still very much in the, in the trans women and women, um, queer theory, et cetera, postmodernist ideology. So if we had, if I had conversations about it at all, which I just didn't with most of my friends, they were largely kind of, um, conforming to the kind of ideology that I'm now I'm now coming up against right quite yeah those conversations are are interesting aren't they sometimes they um did you ever feel like you had to self-censor that's what I was thinking sometimes it starts to feel like you have to either shut up or or have a big confrontation yeah I think um I mean I think that I've my go-to position is self-censoring I mean the last few months, it was very much, um, it was, it's very much been a period of quite intense growth because it, there's had to be, um, cause my, my kind of almost innate tendency is to avoid confrontation. Um, it's to accommodate other people's feelings. It's to try to be nice and, and make sure that no one feels anything bad ever any of the time, um, <laughs> which obviously isn't particularly realistic or healthy. Um, so I think all through the first couple of years of my degree, um, I was aware of the kind of student politics scene in Cambridge. Um, and there is a very vocal and quite a big and a very loud one. Um, and before I came to Cambridge, I thought that I would get quite involved in that. Um, but then as soon as I came here, I kind of found myself almost repelled by it, um, not even because at that point I wasn't really criticizing any of the ideas um, that that are kind of the common currency in those spaces. It was more the way that people approached ideas, um, the all of the no debate, all of the no platforming stuff. I, I didn't kind of have a strong, I'd never, I never articulated it at the time, um, but it did make me feel quite uncomfortable. So I just sort of drifted away from that and didn't get involved um, apart from sort of campaigning for, I campaigned for Labour for the last two elections, um, but that was a very kind of limited and practical contribution, which I think is what I, I think politics should be about practice um, rather than just endless discourse. So I think I would dip in to do that and then I'd kind of fall away again quite quickly. Okay, yeah. That it's really interesting hearing you talk about that because I really relate. I had a really similar experience when I first started university in New York at a very liberal institution that has this history of being really against the grain. Like it was founded by professors who were at Columbia University and they didn't want to sign a statement that said they weren't a communist. It was basically McCarthyism. Oh, and wow. so they started this school. And it was people like Hannah Arendt who were um, dissidents from Europe. So it had this great history. And then when I went there, I just immediately like, it was, I couldn't articulate it. It's like what you're saying. I couldn't articulate what the problem was. I just knew that I didn't quite um, fit in with, with these students very much. And I ended up dropping out after two years and I transferred to the um, public university system which is like sort of for the working class New Yorkers and it was much, much better fit. And all I, the only way I could really articulate it was that these were people who really wanted to be there. They were hardworking, they were focused, they were down to earth, <laughs> but I didn't really know that there was such an intense political um, element behind that and behind why I kind of didn't fit in on my first school and, until I looked back and realized that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think that, that sounds, 
it sounds like a completely parallel experience to be honest um and I think it's interesting that you say that the first school was contrast with the second in terms of the second being more kind of working class more people who'd had to who hadn't necessarily known that they were going to end up at university and, and therefore right. really valued it because I think yeah. I think it's not an accident that places like Cambridge and Oxford um, and I think a lot of the older Ivy League colleges in the states as well um, are a hotbed of this kind of political discourse as well as you know the ideas themselves um, and I think I think the fact that I think the fact that I'd had a slightly um, unconventional trajectory getting to Cambridge um, was probably why I felt so uncomfortable here at first was that um, I mean the year that I did my A-levels I was living in a um, um, in a kind of not a shelter but a like in a special accommodation for young people at risk of homelessness um, and before that I was working for less than minimum wage um, in like a um, in a care in a care work job um, and then I, I got this incredible opportunity to come back to university or come to university for the first time and it just I felt so kind of disjointed and out of place and um, a bit freakish to be honest mm -hmm. because I just I felt like there was some aura around me that was different from everyone else um, mm -hmm. it's really difficult to put into words yeah it is and you know that's interesting I wonder if part of the political ideas and discourse of these of this echelon is kind of i don't know i don't want to make you know too strong of statements that i really i don't know this but my what i saw at that school that first university which has become this super expensive like insanely expensive institution it's super wealthy the president is like you know a millionaire or something like that and he gets his own apartment that comes with a maid. I learned that while I was there, which is just so weird, especially, I don't know, that's also super weird in the US, but in particular for our culture. But um, yeah, the student, you know, is like, I'm not saying I was a perfect student, especially when I first started college, but um, you know, you would, there was a different style of teaching there where um, it was, we would sit around a desk and in a, in a small circle and have like a seminar style discussion. And that was a draw for me. I thought, oh, wow, it's like grad school. It's so advanced. Um, you're really participating. And then by the end of my college experience, I preferred the lecture because I want to hear from the expert in their field. I want to just like sit and take notes. And that's what I'm paying for, absorbing their knowledge and asking them questions and everything like that. But, um, you know, these freshman kids, like they would like skateboard into class, not having done any of the reading. And then they just didn't give a shit. And I wonder if having those politics outside made them feel like they did have something that they knew and that they knew better than the professors or better than I don't know other people yeah I think I think it does it it does sort of maybe intersect with um the fact that the kind of mode of discourse and the ideas that we're talking about um are based on transgression um and sort of postmodernism and and all of this stuff it's kind of there's very much a tendency to just um to just almost like disagree and and have these opinions um that are contrary to whatever's viewed as traditional or whatever the expert is saying um and as if there's something of value in them just by dint of their being transgressive um which i find i, I find i never thought about it before but i think I do see here quite a lot, um, not that there's anything wrong with disagreeing with established ideas and it's important to explore um, and criticize and, and everything. But I think, yeah, I think it's that tendency to view transgression itself as important and good. And it's, I think it does kind of, to me, it, it kind of, it feels like there's a kind of carelessness about, um, access to these ideas and, and thoughts because they've always had it and it's always um, it's always been available to them. Mm. I'm not entirely sure what I'm trying to articulate that, but. Yeah, that's really interesting. It makes me think of, um, you know, like I ended up studying Russian literature and I think that I was really saved from a lot of 
the identitarian madness by being in the Slavic department because um, they're very old fashioned and they're very traditional. And, um, you know, it's not like the stereotype of English class where there's no right answer and any interpretation is right. There is a right answer. There is a correct and an incorrect interpretation. But um, yeah, the idea of, of transgression against the tradition being in itself the the scholarship or being the the contribution somehow yeah that's, that's exactly it mm -hmm. yeah so what um for you then can you tell us what happened with kevin price if people don't know <laughs> <The> story <laughs> that was, no no it's um it's something that it's both sort of a bit soul destroying to talk about and also it feels impossible not to talk about it all of the time because it, I'm so angry still um yeah. which is I perhaps need to calm down a bit because it's it was turned out all right um as so far but anyway sorry I'm getting ahead of myself um so Kevin Price is a porter at Clare College um which is just around the corner from me here in Cambridge um and he's he was also a Labour councillor for Cambridge uh, one of Cambridge's wards um, and he'd been a councillor for 10 years, um, done all and sorts of... Sorry to interrupt you, but for American, I, I might just be the uh, ignorant American, but I didn't fully know what a porter was. So oh, of it's, course. It's that's like not... kind of like a custodian, right? Like, Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's not even just being an American. That's just not being at Cambridge or okay. Oxford because okay. it, uh, there's so <laughs> much, there's such a kind of specific terminology mm -hmm. here that you just pick up and then um, completely forget to explain. But... But yeah, so we have um, a porter's lodge at every college and they're essentially, yes, custodians. Um, they look out, they, they essentially look after us um, as much as, you know, we're adults and in theory don't need looking after, but you know what I mean. Right. Um, so he's, he's a porter at Clare around the corner. Um, he's also, as I say, a, a Labour councillor, or he was. Um, and... I think in November or late October, he resigned from his position as a Labour councillor um, because he didn't want to vote against um, a Labour motion or a Labour amendment to a Lib Dem motion. I, it's all obviously very complicated in local politics and everything. But um, and this amendment was an amendment that um, that would introduce the words trans women or women, non-binary people and non-binary trans men and men um, into a piece of local legislation um and though i think the legislation also had also had a commitment to discuss what kind of pride, pride flag people wanted flying around cambridge and sort of a collection of little things like this um so he resigned because he'd never voted against a labor amendment or a labor motion in all of his 10 years and he didn't want to start now um so it was really very much an an act of conscience um, he was also active on gender critical Twitter. Um, I don't think he ever said anything like objectionable um, at all. He just was there, I think, as a grandfather and a father who wanted to make his voice heard in this, in support of, of women defending our sex-based rights. Um, either way, the pushback against his um, resignation was immense. Um, and it was pretty much entirely driven by students. I think within days there was um, a student campaign for him to be fired. Um, obviously in the middle of a pandemic as a father and grandfather, there were sort of slurs cast on him in our, news, in our local newspaper as well as the student journal, kind of the student newspapers and everything. Um, I think there was kind of a lot of aspersions cast and, and implications that he would somehow be unfit for his role as a porter um, because obviously there's an element of care in that role um, and that he'd somehow be making trans or non-binary people feel unsafe with his presence um, but as I say he'd I mean if you watch his resignation speech which is on YouTube he makes it really clear that he's committed to human rights for everyone um, that he <sighs> there's no place for for violence or you know unkindness or anything else but he just didn't want to make this commitment that trans women are literally women um obviously I'm biased and I, I think that he was he was right to do that um but I think I think that was the point at which 
I got quite angry and got quite involved along with a few other students um, because if you take a step back from the kind of echo chamber of student politics that exists at Cambridge, what was actually happening was a load of students were trying to get a porter fired. Um, and these are students, I don't want to make generalizations because, you know, people, not, not everyone at Cambridge is rich and lives in a mansion, but I think a lot more of us are than, than in the general population. So I think I just found it completely unacceptable that this was happening. Mm -hmm. And then, so you're watching this go down and what was the moment where you decided to, to speak up and to be open about it? Um, I'd actually just decided, just before this happened, I decided that I was gonna stop speaking quite so much about this. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> because uh, I'd been, um, since the JK Rowling thing on Facebook, um, not on Facebook, since the JK Rowling thing, I'd been kind of beginning to question the ideology that I'd kind of implicitly accepted for was since I was a teenager. Um, and at that point, I didn't realize that it wasn't okay to do that. So I would share articles on my on my Facebook with obviously fellow students on there um, and have kind of quite long, intense conversations um, in the comment sections and everything kind of saying, well, I think my argument amounted to it doesn't matter if she's a transphobe, it's still wrong that she's getting this kind of tidal wave of misogynistic abuse, death and rape threats um, spewed at her. And I was kind of, I was also struggling a little bit with, um, because there had been a few articles about detransitioners in the media recently, um, which really touched me. And I tried to do my dissertation, my undergraduate dissertation on detransitioners. I'd actually oh. proposed that. Um, and I, it almost didn't occur to me that that would be a problem, um, that I, I was at Cambridge and I thought, I'm at Cambridge, there's no possibility that they're not gonna let me do this. If, if I do it in good faith, if I kind of do it in an evidence-based objective way, um, mm -hmm. but it got shut down pretty immediately. Wow. So that was quite shocking um, from my perspective. I think, I think yeah. you, you, read, you read my blog post about mm -hmm. um, Nullius and Verba and everything. And I think it's quite clear from that blog post that I kind of have, really ide idealized Cambridge in the past before I got here. Mm. So it was a bit sort of groundbreaking and, and frightening to me to realize that actually Cambridge isn't immune from, from bias and from fear of kind of political consequences in research. Right, that's, that's pretty crazy. So which, at what, what month and what year was it that it, they shut you down on your um, proposal? It was 2020. It was towards the end of the summer holidays. Um, so kind of just just before I came back to Cambridge for this academic year. Okay. Um, and I'd I'd done loads of research. I got um, Charlie Evans on board. She's she's fantastic. She's um, if you're listening, she's the founder of the Detransition Advocacy Network here in the UK um, and a detransitioner okay. herself. She's brilliant. Um, and I had this long phone call with her where I said, um, I can see that this is a vulnerable population and what psychology is supposed to do is um, look at the facts, look at what's happening. And then, I mean, good research can suggest future research that, and sort of clinical interventions that might be helpful and, and all of this. So I thought there's a, there's a gap in the research literature here that could be really kind of valuable to fill. And there's almost nothing on it, despite it clearly being really important for hundreds or thousands of women as it and, and men I suppose right. as as is becoming increasingly clear um, right right and it just got I, I had one conversation with a potential supervisor and um at first she tried to convince me that there weren't enough detransitioners in the world for me to find the 15 to 20 that I'd need to interview wow. for a basic qualitative study um and then about I don't know I, I kind of push back against that thinking yeah. that she was coming in good faith um and she just kind of slipped it into the conversation you know, I wouldn't be comfortable supervising that and I just remember being 
I don't think I don't think I even reacted. I think I just looked at her in shock for about a second and then she moved on in the conversation and um and we were just and it and then it was over. Um and obviously afterwards I tried to get other people to supervise me and I sent out a load of emails and I just didn't hear anything back. And then sorry, this is a whole saga, but No, um, this is really interesting actually, because it's like what's happening in academia. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, then I actually went back to Charlie um, and she'd mentioned that she might be able to help me with an external supervisor. Um, and there are obviously some brilliant feminist academics who I'd never really heard of at that point, like like Kathleen Stock or Sheila Jeffries. Um, and Sheila Jeffries is in sociology, so potentially could have supervised, um, you know, something like this. Um, but and I went back to the psychology department and and, and said, you know, I, I, can, I can make this happen, I think. Um, but they told me, I think ultimately what killed it completely after kind of a few weeks of email back and forths was that they didn't think they'd be able to find a, an examiner capable of, um, capable and willing, I think were the words used to, um, you know, to evaluate the research that I, any research that I could potentially produce on detransition. So, that was a bit of an eye opener for me. Wow. So what would the examiner's role have been like to just to oversee mark it? I mean, to, just to mark it. Okay. Yeah. Because the supervisor who I would have got externally would have, you know, done all of the, the ongoing work and, and advised me and everything. And um, Charlie, Charlie Evans actually agreed to be in a, a kind of formal advisor for the research project as well to make sure that, you know, detransitioners voices were kind of centered and their needs were heard and all of this. Um, and all the examiner would have had to do was mark it, but that just wasn't possible, apparently. Wow. So they didn't even feel or, you know, who knows really what it is, but that they could just impartially mark it on its value, on its, uh, the, the writing, the research methodology, the, like, that's kind of insane to me. It was to me as well. Yeah. Um, I think... Initially, I couldn't believe that, I thought there must be a logical explanation for this. Um, the world can't be quite this mad. And like I say, I'd really built Cambridge up in my head as something something kind of free or outside of all of um, the kind of bollocks that has come with the privatis privatizations of, um, of universities elsewhere and, and all of that. Um, but, so this was kind of the moment where I realized that it wasn't. And I think around the same time, I came across an article about um, someone who was looking to do a postgrad dissertation on detransition and the needs of detransitioners at Bath Spa University. And he'd actually been told outright that um, this would be kind of politically dangerous. And that was why they weren't going to let him do it. So for the first time, I began to allow myself to think, oh, actually, this maybe this does actually go that deep. Um, that yeah. Cambridge, who don't have to worry about funding from from the government or from from anyone really, um, are, are also in this position. Wow, um, this <laughs> I want to say this thing because it's actually hilarious. But there was this undergrad thesis from some college here that was about um, turf tracking. So they let this through. So I actually kind of want to see if I can find it because it was just so crazy. Yeah. A few months ago, there was um, an Atlantic article. I don't know if you saw it. It was called The Secret Internet of Turfs. Wow, I, I feel like I haven't been invited to The Secret Internet of Turfs. <laughs> I think you're, I think this is it right now. Wow. So we're on it, we're on it right now. But um, it was mostly about uh, the website Over It. Have you heard of Over It? Yeah, yeah, it's, it sounds like a fantastic initiative. Yeah, um, so this article was also kind of a hit piece of my friend MK Fain, who doesn't even have anything to do with Over It, but she's friends with the creators and she's a feminist programmer. So she's she is a tech person and she is being accused of being a turf in this article. But one of the things they cited, and I just, I'm trying to find it, but hopefully I'll be able to find it right now in this article, was it was so bizarre because she cited an undergraduate thesis in her Atlantic article, which I think is really weird. 
just mm. in general, right? It's not very journalistic. No. Yeah. And then um, it was, so I had to check out some of her sources and this one was so weird. It was this creepy turf tracker and the whole thesis, I didn't read it all, but you know, I have some self-preservation, <laughs> but um, yeah, I was going to say, God, I mean, it's, that sounds exhausting. This whole thought process sounds exhausting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, I don't even know how the, the author of this article, Caitlin Tiffany, how she even like conceptualized doing this. Um, she got so much, su- such a huge response of criticism afterwards. And she didn't, it seemed like she just kind of shut her Twitter down and didn't take any of it into account. Um, uh, now I can't find that link. But anyway, it was this really, maybe I'll be able to find it after and like insert it on the screen. It was really disturbing. It was like they were tracking all these Twitter users and just completely blatantly like we're tracking these people because they're hateful. Just these women saying, you know, the, the same type of stuff that I think we tweet and maybe that Kevin Price yeah. was tweeting about. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, sorry, that was like a super long diversion, but just I'm shocked about that your thesis being rejected and this thesis obviously completely different context than American University, but this got through and was like, and now it's being cited in the Atlantic as though it's some like amazing groundbreaking piece. It's, it's garbage. Um, yeah. Whereas yours would have been useful and made a contribution. And now that's not there. That's kind of scary. It is. And, um, you know, it still, it still bothers me that there isn't the research literature for detransition. Um, I mean, there's, I, I looked into this when I was writing a proposal and there's just nothing about, there's just nothing about what detransitioners might need. There's nothing about the process that they might go through, nothing about, you know, interventions that might be helpful. Um, nothing about the causes of detransition really either, because presumably that's too threatening. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's all, whenever detransition is mentioned in kind of academic research, it's it's in order to minimize its its kind of effects or its size. It's there's one there's one research paper that gets cited all the time. Um, I think that it's like one percent less than one percent of trans people detransition. Um, no, I don't know. I remember looking into that and looking at the kind of research methodology and finding it a bit like obviously limited and questionable or you know decent research for what it was trying to prove. But I mean, it. I think it wasn't even. It just, it isn't, you can't take a single paper like that um, and then and then use that to shut down the possibility of doing any kind of future research on that population. Right. It, it is mad. It's, it's horrible. It's frightening. Yeah. And to say, like you said, people are always citing that, oh, it's only 1% or less. Well, then let people do the research. You know, yeah. there's clearly something that's not acceptable to be looked into here and that's all the more reason to look into it um which I kind of get from you is your mode like you you want it you're curious you're inquisitive right so you you wanted to look under that rock thank you yeah I mean I think at this point I still believed all of the like the trans women or women kind of stuff Mm -hmm. I hadn't even really kind of delved into that or questioned that because it, it didn't really feel safe to you I mean not in terms of other people but in terms of having grown up on the internet and kind of being Mm -hmm. my politics having been really formed by these online spaces like tumblr um and also by the kind of this idea that language itself equals literal violence and then by a short leap of of the imagination thought equals violence yeah I, I really I really believed all of this stuff that like if someone said trans women aren't women, then more trans women were going to be murdered somehow um, or going to commit suicide or or whatever else. And I, I don't want to trivialize, you know, either of those things, but I think it's clear that that, us, that, that saying that a woman is defined by sex, um, especially in kind of academic and political contexts, I mean, saying that in those contexts, um, it, it isn't gonna kill anyone it's not going to hurt anyone. Um, right. It's, so yeah, it was, it was, when I was looking into this stuff, um, the detransition stuff, I wasn't coming at it 
with an agenda I was coming at it just with curiosity because I think someone in my life had just detransitioned um I was kind of hearing stories about it and I was aware that I was kind of aware of and uncomfortable with the fact that the person who detransitioned was so nervous about the reaction of other people at Cambridge um and sort of of being accused of like being a traitor or, or not a traitor in, in those words but of yeah I, it just I was beginning to question it all I suppose and then the detransition disc really just it, it sort of toppled me off the, the edge of that cliff yeah so what happened then when you did topple off that cliff what was the next what did you learn what did you find out I guess I discovered radical feminism um so thank god that that happened yeah. um and I mean I am I am really new to this stuff given that this is all it's about like six months six months yeah yeah it's been about like six months that I've sort of considered myself a radical feminist or even really known what it was um I remember I read Andrea Dworkin when I was 13 and sort of loved it and was frightened by it um because obviously I was 13 and I was, right. I was reading it. <laughs> it's really young to read Andrea Dworkin. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, even then, I think, even then I'd had experiences with sort of, I mean, nothing too serious, but with men and, and with the way that I was beginning to be perceived in the world that meant that reading that book did resonate with me, okay. resonate with me even then. Yeah. Um, but obviously I wasn't kind of ready for it as a political um kind of, as a way of looking at the world in the way that I am now when it's it's so much more relevant but yeah so I, I found radical feminism um and it kind of just brought all of these threads together for me um because at the same time that I'd been spending all those years including at Cambridge feeling slightly uncomfortable with the trans women or women stuff but also feeling like I wasn't allowed to question it because I'd somehow be hurting someone um at the same time I'd been kind of horribly aware of the role of like male violence in my life and in the lives of other women and there was nowhere there was no way of articulating that for me in that position in that kind of mode of political discourse in that um in Cambridge student politics and Tumblr politics you're not really allowed to talk about male violence, either because it's transphobic or um, because it's kind of, I, I, I don't know. I think there's this idea that being against, I mean, being against porn or being against prostitution or anything else is hurtful to people who've been involved in that. So you're not allowed to talk about that either or, or feel it. Um, right. So I remember when I started having like casual sex um, and having kind of slightly traumatic experiences in the same way that I think most most women have um, feeling like I couldn't I, I feeling like I couldn't really talk about that because because sex is just supposed to be kind of completely um, harmless and right. easy and, and women are supposed to feel the same about sex as men do all right. of the time mm -hmm. so radical feminism was like I kind of came into it via the gender stuff and via the detransition stuff and then it just it was like a revelation because it tied all of this stuff that I've been feeling for so long together in my head. That's really interesting yeah I noticed such a especially in hindsight I noticed such a culture of exactly what you just said that when I was in college well in in my first university that it was cool to um you know sleep around if you're a girl like I'm talking about women young women and um I was seeing a lot of friends getting hurt over and over again but there was no like stop look look at what what's happening and why it might be so damaging I mean that's mm. that is something when you're young you just you're doing stuff you don't know the larger what it means to you necessarily um so i don't blame them at all it's it's something that was in the air in the culture yeah. it was like we grew up with this encouragement to be slutty honestly i'm going to use a derogatory word because that's a virtue now and there's this slogan like be a slut do whatever you want it's yeah. a cute thing now it's it's trendy 
And I agree, there's a lot of trauma that lurks just right on the other side of that for girls. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I think you can you can make the argument that some women come through it completely unscathed and, and maybe mm. they do, I don't know. Yeah. But but that's not been my experience. And it's not been the experience of most of my friends. Um, I think it's true. You, if you're if you're in my generation, you grow up you grow up watching like Friends, um, you know, reruns of Friends in the afternoon mm-hmm. or whatever when you're a kid, and there are the women on Friends, right? Like Phoebe and uh, Rachel and Monica, and they they date and they they have casual sex, and nothing bad ever happens. Mm-hmm. Like they just they meet men at weddings and they meet them when they move into new apartments or whatever, and then they just they have sex and they have relationships and maybe, and the worst thing that a man can do to you is like not call you back. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, in the real world, I think it varies slightly by luck, but I think I think most women have a collection of like slightly horrible stories mm-hmm. um, starting at puberty. And then when you start actually dating men and putting yourself in positions actively where you're vulnerable with men that kind of collection of stories begins to grow um but it's just there's no modern feminism has no real language to describe it because the idea is that if you consented to something um whether that however dubious that consent may have been because no one can tell um then it's fine because consent is the difference between trauma and and pleasure so it's it's it was just it's just bizarre and so I think that's why radical feminism among other reasons has become so important to me so quickly is that it's like discovering that there's actually this whole language this whole collection of concepts um and of words and feelings that have been articulated by women um and it was there the whole time and I just I just didn't know it was and now I do and it's just it honestly it's so freeing and and I mean it's horrible on one level because once you start acknowledging this stuff it's difficult but on the other it's just it's just fantastic yeah yeah um well I'm glad to hear you say that and I want to get into that but you did make me think of another thing that you know and and certainly the acknowledgement that for some women this is it works for them and I've I've seen that I've also had friends like that um, mm. but not most, I think it just anecdotally, um, yeah. fairly anecdotally, but, um, so, but the problem is that a lot of young women who aren't suited to it are, are doing it. And it made me think of, you know, even the not like him not calling back thing after you yeah. have sex, it made me think of, um, is cause like, how do we conceptualize that in our modern era, you know, in, in war and peace this is a very emblematic story that has happened many, many times, but where the woman gets jilted, like seduced and then jilted. So Natasha, she's young, she has her fiance who's very like pr- appropriate and every doing everything properly courting her. But then she meets this like young, hot guy, you know, they go to the opera together and then, <laughs> well, not together, but they see each other there and she gets totally seduced and um, by his, he's sort of like, you know, a bit, a bit bad. He's a bad boy. And she, um, she falls into this trap and she agrees to elope with him. Like, this is really bad. Like she'll ruin all her future prospects and stuff, but she agrees. And so it's kind of like a kidnapping. He has to come and kidnap her from her parents' house. Um, and it all goes awry and they get caught and she doesn't go and she's really upset and she thinks her life is over. Um, she's like a dramatic teenager as well. But, you know, it was a clearly like this thing about being that his plan was, I should explain, his plan was basically just a pump and dump. Like that was his plan. He was going to take her, he was going to take her out of her, you know, loving family home and then bring her across the border and then marry her, marry her and then ditch her. Like he already had a wife, I think, and a kid somewhere else. So yeah, this was a really, really bad guy. But yeah. um, so yeah. that concept, like now it's just like, that's not a thing anymore. That's not a problem anymore, but it still mm-hmm. is a problem, right? Yeah. Like in real life for, for women. Definitely. And I've, I've been thinking about this in like, um, in, 
in Jane Austen actually mm. recently because everyone thinks of Jane Austen as being like this kind of um, sort of the ultimate romantic, um, fluffy lace dresses. I don't know. Um, that's what love is. And and there's also this misconception that her heroes are like kind of brooding and, and dangerous. I think mostly because Darcy is like an idiot who can't string two words together in the in, in, in Pride and Prejudice. Um, but actually, if you like, if you read the books, she's she has such a grasp on the risks that that women face from men. Um, obviously, without ever going anywhere near really a description of, of sexual violence or anything graphic, um, she recognizes that women are they're they're kind of they're walking this tightrope um, between between security that will fundamentally be or like ultimately be degrading because there's not respect even if there is respectability and then on the other hand um kind of a short-term pleasure but then the fact that that men do discard women fairly easily or certain men do so I just I kind of I think it's interesting how literature back then um it, it absolutely recognizes implicitly and sometimes explicitly this stuff. And obviously you could say that kind of modern um, drama, like like Friends or whatever, doesn't do that because yeah. times have changed. Um, but I don't think times have changed quite as much as we sometimes think because we're still, we're still fundamentally human. We still, we still have emotions and the cost of, the cost of casual sex is actually a lot higher for women than it is for men in terms of the risk to reputation, in terms of the risk of pregnancy, of um, like I and contraception as well. I mean, the side effects of being on the pill are horrific. I had the IUD put in like a few months ago and that was pretty horrific, but it's all, I don't know, there's just so much attached to being a woman putting yourself in these situations before you even get to the possibility of, of, of rape and of sexual assault and right. I've had friends that have been through that and I've been through that to a degree as well in these situations and but there's no acknowledgement of it there's no language of it not really because rape and sexual violence in kind of modern media and, and television is something that it's something that happens in dark alleys um because we're not allowed to talk about the fact that there are risks attached to casual sex for women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that there's this, you know, like it's not just rape or great sex, like you're saying. Yeah. I mean, it's there's a lot of gray area and there's, you know, there's um, consensual but unwanted sex, which can have an effect on the psychological state. It's, it's not a crime, obviously no crime has been committed, but we don't talk about that really. Absolutely. And I think you're right. That's almost, I mean, because we do have the language to talk about rape and, and sexual violence to a much greater degree than we have the language to talk about what you're describing, unwanted but consensual sex. Um, and then we also have, of course, the influence of porn on consensual sex, where now men just kind of do do things without asking that, like, I think even five years ago, maybe, I don't know, five or 10 years ago would have been completely unthinkable. I think the fact that women don't have the language to talk about this and that feminism doesn't give them the language to talk about this or mainstream feminism doesn't, it's just, it's it's a travesty, it's, it's awful. And that's why radical feminism is so important to me now. Yeah, did you find like when you started getting into radical feminism, did it have an effect on your personal well-being like on your did it yeah like how did that affect you I think um I think it had a really great effect in terms of what I was saying earlier about having suddenly having the language or feeling like I it's funny how once you have the words to describe something you feel like it's all right to feel it yeah um, so knowing that women have been saying these things and, and articulating these things for years just made me feel like I wasn't alone. Um, I think at the same time, it, as I, I mean, there's, there's this Andrea Dworkin quote um, about feminism, something, something like women resist feminism because it's an agony to, um, to recognize the misogyny 
that exists in in culture and politics and in every personal relationship so I think there's also an element of that like in radical feminism and in my discovery of radical feminism where sometimes it feels just so much um it feels so overwhelming but at the same time I was always feeling that I just didn't have the words for it before so it's I think it, the benefits massively outweigh outweigh the negatives yeah it's there's something so so helpful about having the words to describe the experience and like you said knowing that other women have gone through it it's it takes a lot of the burden off your shoulders and yeah. I experienced a similar thing when I first discovered radical feminism now, I don't consider myself a radical feminist but um but I had something very similar I was like okay it's not just me <laughs> it's really something bigger and yeah. I think that's good. I mean, I think that can lead to something a little too much where you don't have any sense of responsibility over your own life. Um, yeah. So I've had to kind of reel back from that where it's like, okay, that was a great discovery that I'm not alone and you're never alone. I mean, you're never really having unique experiences on on this earth, but, yeah. um, but, but you're still responsible for, for your experiences. Yeah. So, well, in some, in some regards. So yeah. yeah, there's a bit of a balance there. But yeah, but radical feminism is, you know, it's it, it exists for young women to to, to be have given that. that. Yeah. yeah. No, and I, I think I agree. Like, I think, I always think that, I mean, I'm being really hypocritical, but I always think that politics shouldn't be your whole personality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I don't just mean that in terms of being interesting to other people or in terms of what you talk about. I think you always have to just keep back a slither of yourself, at least, which just recognizes the humanity in everyone and, and doesn't see them in terms of the concepts or in terms of the power dynamics that you've managed to articulate or that you've found being articulated. Because, I mean, m my mum was a young woman around the time of the second wave or growing up and kind of in her 20s, I think in the 80s. And she was really not that involved in, in second wave feminism or anything because I think she found the whole, a woman needs a man, like a fish needs a bicycle kind of stuff. She found it just sort of really um, bizarre and alienating because of course she did have men she loved in her life. And, um, you know, I have I have a lot of respect for women who and, and for radical feminists who manage to live without men um, and, and everything. But I personally, for me, I think feminism describes it's a tool. Radical feminism is a, is a tool or a conceptualization that you can use to understand your experience and to understand what's going on in the world. But you have to be able to take a step back as well. And, and like I say, just look look at the person sitting across from you, I guess, and just see them rather than the labels attached to them. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that I've so been leaning into these past few months since I got canceled. I think one of the <laughs> one of the main things I really have, have gotten from it is that um, labels don't matter. I mean, the labels that I've been given, whew, you know, like if you yeah. believed them, it would be all, I mean, it'd be all over the place, but, um, and a lot of really bad labels. So, yeah. And even the labels that I think apply like progressive, then they go, oh, you're not, you're not progressive. You're, you're not on the left because you're a turf, like quote unquote turf. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, the, the point about seeing people as people, I completely agree. Like I don't uh, have a worldview of like all women are oppressed individuals and all men are oppressors. I don't think that's a good uh, paradigm. And you have to be able to recognize, I mean, I, this is maybe a slightly controversial thing for a radical feminist to say, but it, it I mean, it shouldn't be. Right. Um, you have to recognize that, I mean, men are hurt by patriarchy as well. Um, and that men suffer for other reasons aside from yeah. patriarchy. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think in the UK, the um, the most at-risk demographic for suicide is 18 to 24-year-old men. Um, and, you know, I, I have a brother in that age group, so I'm kind of like, I think I remember hearing that statistic and thinking of him and, and I, I don't know, of the men who are in my life who I love and who are just 
decent, wonderful human beings, um, even flawed human beings as well. And they're more than just the oppressor and I'm more than yeah. just the oppressed. Right, precisely. Yeah, and even sometimes in radical feminism, there is a lack of um, empathy for human rights problems that afflict men, um, like prison, you know, I mean, I think we need to talk about female prisons and, and talk about, you know, how to stop mass incarceration of females uh, in, especially in the US, we have, you know, so many and it's not for, it's not because they're a danger to society, but we also have men who are locked up who aren't a danger to society. And for me, that's not something that I have a huge um, distinction between, you know, they're both equally important to me. Yeah. So, um, and then I think that's, that's another thing is that in the gender critical movement, I've seen so many men stand up and say, like that they, that they're standing up for us. And it's yeah. probably the most that I've ever experienced that in my life of having men stand up for me for against, yeah. you know, sexist attacks and seeing those sexist attacks for what they are. And yeah. that's been incredible. And I think, you know, so I want to give them credit too, but. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think there's, there's obviously a balance to be struck because, you know, when we announced our replatforming deplatformed women um, lecture series, we got a load of um, men who I think maybe followed me or followed us or probably me from the, from the free speech kind of stuff that I've done mm -hmm. um, coming onto our Twitter kind of posts um, and Facebook posts announcing that and sort of saying things like, oh, pathetic, free speech just for women. Um, why aren't you doing it for the men too? And obviously when it comes to like feminist activism or feminist organizing, I think we have to be okay saying we are unapologetically doing this for women. Mm -hmm. We're focusing on women right now. We have limited time and resources. This is what we're gonna do. Yeah. But I think, I think that at the same time, you can balance that with what we've just been talking about, where as a human being, where you're also a human as well as someone who's organizing something or um, running something or engaging in something, you can still and you can still recognize the humanity of other people. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, but those the the men who are supporting gender critical women, they support that. They understand why it should be women replatformed, you know. So the yeah. douchebags who come on and say it's pathetic, it's like, so what are you You're just shutting this down. You don't actually care because why aren't you organizing a replatformed men then? Like, I mean, exactly. I know that's kind of a tired old refrain. Like, why aren't you doing it? But um, but still, it's like the men who get it actually understand why it should be women being replatformed yeah. and that it's specifically women's voices being shut down right now in yeah. ponderance because it's also men's too but yeah and yeah no I, I I absolutely agree like I think yeah we have to be able to recognize that there are those men and they do exist and and accept their help when when we can yeah and then also we have to remember to ignore the the ones who are coming on and saying it's pathetic to platform women because that's just ridiculous um, and how is that in support of free speech? You know what I mean? I think, oh, exactly. just, yeah. I think, I think if, if these people really believed in free speech, they wouldn't be go coming to the radical feminist network and saying, <laughs> you should be doing this for everyone. Right. right. They'd yeah. Just be good, but, because no. sometimes it's good to have exclusive causes, right? That's, that's another central facet of this. It's like inclusion is not the highest virtue in every no. situation. No, God, no, exactly. And I mean, you can respect someone and respect their needs or respect even a, a subgroup or a population or, or whatever without having to include them in everything, for everyone exactly. all the time. And I exactly. do think it's interesting that it's it's always women's spaces that they need to be included in because, yep. I mean, in my own college, we have a women and non-binary officer. We have, I mean, it's at the rugby team at, at Cambridge, the women's rugby team. Um, obviously there, I think, I'm not sure if there's yet a trans, trans woman who's going to be on it. Um, I think she is already playing, um, but there's also a, a trans man and they're also playing on um, on the female team because that's the one that aligns with their biology. So it kind of it kind of just feels like a like a convenience for convenience's sake, like whatever's easiest for for males. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
is really frustrating. <laughs> right. It's like men and other. <laughs> yeah. It's like just men are in category and then it's just like the odds and ends gets thrown in under women. Yeah. The island of misfit toys or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And you hear these phrases coming from like queer theory and queer culture that are like, um, fems and thems or stuff like that where they're like lumping in like just anybody who is femme like anybody who's feminine no matter what they're male or female are sort of lumped in together um so coming back around to Kevin Price um so all this stuff is happening you're thinking about all these topics and seeing all this stuff go down um and having your own arc and your own development so you at some point you decided to write about Kevin so tell us about that. Yeah, um, I I think I tweeted angrily about it and I tweeted also saying, God, I'm gonna have to, I, I want to write something about this. Um, I need to do something um, because I just, I was kind of furious. I couldn't concentrate on anything else. I was, God, it was a really, it was a really tense couple of months to be honest, because there was so much cognitive dissonance going on and the awareness that I was making my friends uncomfortable and that I was making difficulties for them for being associated with me. And then also still being in the process of becoming sure of my opinions about feminism. So it was just, it was really horrible. And actually writing was like the first step to um, finding my way out of that and finding my way into not certainty, but a kind of, being comfortable taking a position and and sticking to it and 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 knowing that I was and knowing that it was right to take that position um so I um I initially tried to get something published in um the Cambridge student which is one of our student magazines because it seemed it seemed right that there should be something in one of our student publications and varsity which is the other major publication here is um I I don't know I think they they would they just ran um incredible just some incredibly poor pieces of reporting um you know incredibly biased absolutely no hint of another view um so I wanted to get something published in the Cambridge Press and the comment editor at the TCS reached out to me and he's again we're talking about I guess um a man who's supportive of of feminism and of women um he's a really nice bloke who um you know sort of did his best to get me published or get the piece published because he thought that it was important that there be an opposing view um in the you know in in the media in our local media but it just got blocked at a higher level again um I think because Sam who's the comment editor had just he'd just published a piece in the TCS um basically saying there should not be as much misogyny directed at JKR as there is, regardless of what your thoughts on her alleged transphobia are. Um, and I think within like a few hours of that being posted, they'd been inundated with requests for him to take it for them to take it down. Um, and it, and the the senior editors had caved and taken it down wow. um, again because of this idea that trans students or non-binary students would feel like unsafe. Um, just mm-hmm at this being published, whether or not they had to read it, that's that's how it works apparently. Um, yeah. So TCS were obviously very kind of um, gun shy of publishing anything like that again. So I reached out to Unheard just kind of on a, I think on a wave of fury because I wouldn't have had the confidence to do that otherwise probably. And um, and I was really, really pleased that they, they published me. They thought that that was, they thought that it was an important topic and I was just it was just such a breath of fresh air to find that not everyone was like the people at Cambridge who who have such a kind of rigid view Mm -hmm. yeah so if people haven't read Sophie's piece it's in unheard it's short and excellent and just right to the point um what was the reaction like when you wrote the piece when it Um, came out I think I almost took myself out of any situation where I would feel the reaction um I kind of I, I'm really lucky to have friends who even the ones who are interested in politics and who disagree with me are mostly kind of um happy to still be, you know be friends and can see past the fact that we disagree 
um, but most most of my friends do you know do do see where I'm coming from with this. Um, I was kind of aware from then on though that I had kind of irrevocably labeled myself as a turf and that I couldn't do things. I don't know, I knew that I was at that point I was thinking about applying to masters maybe in um, in gender studies or um, if or I was hoping to find a women's studies course but that doesn't exist anymore. Right. Um, so I was kind of aware that I might be shutting down. I probably burned that bridge. Um, also that you know if I wanted to pursue the detransition research at postgrad which was something that I was seriously thinking about then I might well get rejected on that basis as well that I kind of demonstrated myself to be a turf or whatever. I think in my college there was already quite a lot of hostility towards me just from the Facebook stuff that I'd been I'd been posting. Nothing you know particularly serious happened I think I was just I just became quite like paranoid and um, I think I lost a few I've, I've lost a few friends but um, but I mean it's mostly just been sort of ghosting me and then I find out afterwards that they're um, that they're talking about me in group chats and sort of it's sort of all this very juvenile um, idiotic stuff and and the people who matter are still you know are still here so I'm, I'm really lucky because obviously I am a student and the bridges I'm burning are hypothetical, whereas for a lot of women, I mean, like you, you know better than anyone, um, being vocal about this stuff can actually really affect your livelihood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, well, I'm glad to hear that the, the people who matter were still there and same with me. It was like, it ultimately turned into a blessing because I wouldn't have wanted to be in a field, in a career, in a company where I had to self-censor or and or I was hated for my views, you know, like, so, yeah. um, so what was it in class? Was there ever, did you ever feel, you know, weird vibes from people or, or walking on campus or anything like that? I mean, walking around campus and going to my, um, to the cafe in my college and stuff when when that was still a possibility. Um, I was, I mean, weird vibes is probably a good way to put it. I just, I'm, but it's difficult to know what, to what extent that's, that's paranoia um, and to what extent that's, um, that's actual, you know, people were actually looking at me funny or whatever. I, I, I had a few things like people, I think probably the most, um, I'm trying, I don't know, I don't want to overstate the seriousness of this because, you know, I have friends in the Radical Feminist Network who've, who are having to pursue disciplinary action because people are talking about raping and murdering them, you know, in a jokey way in group chats. And I've never, to my knowledge, I've never had anything like that. But it just sort of things like um, one sort of acquaintance or a friend of a friend reached out to me to tell me that she was... I think deeply uncomfortable with my my views about JK Rowling and then we we had this long conversation about it where I ad admitted that um you know I was worried about having males in in female only spaces and single sex spaces probably partially because I've had life experiences where you know I I know that men aren't always safe and that men can do things so which I thought was a pretty tame admission to make um but then a few a few weeks later, that kind of that friendship ended because she sent me a message essentially saying that um, that she was sorry for my trauma, but that she hoped I would find a way of getting better and no longer putting trans women in danger or like fear mongering about trans women. Um, I don't know. It was just it was again. This this is very trivial compared to some of the stuff that women go through but and I think at that point I was a lot more confident in myself um I think I've I had a, a sort of a wobbly moment where I before I realized that it was just gaslighting essentially right. but right. yeah I mean just sort of uncomfortable small things really um and I don't want to overstate what's happened I just I think since I've got more involved with the Cambridge Radical Feminist Network I'm I get messages from women saying that um, I'm being talked about in group chats in a way that concerns them or like 
the level of aggression concerns them or whatever. Um, and are the group chats people at Cambridge? Yeah, this is all okay. student level stuff. Um, okay. And again, so I mean, I'm not really, I'm not really scared for my safety. I'm not scared for my job because I don't have one. Obviously, maybe a silver lining of the pandemic has been that everything has been online. Um, I'm back in Cambridge now, but it's, you know, I'm not kind of in positions where I'm in lecture halls and sort of hush falls over the lecture hall or yeah. anything like that. So right. nothing too dramatic. Yeah, the big bad turf enters the room, right? <laughs> it's so, we're so scary. Um, it's really funny. I'm, there's, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a how to spot turf ideology um, guide. For no, I haven't the, seen that. The Sheep Union um, produced it a few, a couple of years ago. And um, I think that got sent around all, to all of my friends. Oh, someone went through all of my friends on Facebook when I first started posting about JK Rowling and um, like warned them that I was a turf in case they wanted to unfriend me and, and not see any of my horrible transphobic stuff. And, and then it turned out that that person was um, actually employed by the university. So that was a bit wild, but Whoa. Like, yeah. But it's, again, it's just so, it's so juvenile and it's so stupid. And when yeah. I think of, when I think of the stuff that, you know, that other women are going through, I don't, I count myself pretty lucky. And that includes, I mean, women in my network, I think, because I'm at Newnham, which is all female for the moment. Um, I'm not, I don't feel, threatened like physically um so that's I think it's fine it was a bit stressful and it, it, it continues yeah. stressful, but it's ultimately not it's not a bad deal you know mm -hmm. um, do you know who that employee was or do you mind saying what their position was the one who tried to to went through your friend's list like that I think so I think it's a kind of it's a it's it was just it's a student who just graduated or like taken a, a year out um, and then was employed by the university, I think to be, I think like the disability support officer, which obviously includes mental health. So I thought oh it was funny God. that they were <laughs> going and harassing me. But um, yeah, I think I mostly found it upsetting because I thought someone who was maybe a little bit more amenable to being bullied or maybe a bit more sensitive or whatever would have been within their rights to be really freaked out by that. And I mean, I, like I say, I am fine. Um, but I just, I do think, I hate that someone thought that that was a good idea or that a, an employee in a position of power thought that was a good idea. Right. I mean, it's like, there are some things that are fireable. You know what I mean? It's like, I support anyone's free speech, no matter how vehemently I disagree with them. But that's yeah. actually something where you're misusing your position and you're harassing. Pe I mean, plus, it's just so Stasi, like, let me go through her friends list and warn them about her evil turf views. It's, I mean, I don't even know how to, it, it, it makes me so angry. Yeah, I think it's, I think you kind of you have to laugh or cry after a while don't you because yeah. the yeah. the earnestness of it like the pomposity of it is <laughs> actually hilarious um it's true it's just obviously then when people I think the times that I get really exhausted and low about all of this stuff is is like when we found out that my my friend in the network was um you know was being talked about by these these men at her college in that way and I mean that that it's at that point where you, you can't laugh anymore I guess and you you just have to live with the fact that actually there's this misogyny yeah this really violent misogyny at our university among not the pro-life society or the conservative society or whatever the stereotype of violent misogynists is but among the people who tweet in solidarity with us on international women's day right and all of this, right. all of that stuff. That's what's so insane, isn't it? And um, what what university was that, if you don't mind saying, or if you can say, with your friend? Oh, that's actually Cambridge as well. Oh, that was also Cambridge. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. So, and then is she, it, she works with you in which capacity? In the network, in the Radical Feminist Network. Okay. But um, they've, I won't go into that just because I think she's pursuing disciplinary action and I don't want to oh. 
Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Mess okay. that up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope that goes well for her. And if she does go public with it, she's going to get a huge amount of support and we're behind her. Just if she's listening to this or she knows, you know, I, I interviewed um, Raquel Rosario Sanchez. If you know who she is, she is a student I love at her. Bristol. Yeah. She's awesome. And she's been through, you know, been through the shit with this. So, I mean, she has massive support. So I think that's what, you know, you can expect if, if you come out with something like that, um, I hope, I hope. And um, so, by the way, what happened with Kevin Price? Was he he did resign, so he no longer works at Cambridge. Or? He resigned from the his position as a councillor, which is in the local government. Um, but he's still employed as a porter, as far as I know. Okay. Um, okay. He's just keeping his head down, I think, yeah. and getting on with it as he would. Um, I think the student campaign, more or less like just died out because I think I know that he had to have a meeting with the senior tutor so because they had to be seen to be kind of taking it seriously and maybe they were I don't know um but I, I hope they weren't because frankly it, it was just these students who are almost thriving on like I, I don't know on, on trying to victimize someone who's given a decade of their lives to helping people of Cambridge and then also I think of, has worked at the college for about a decade as well so it's just it's 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 messed up but yeah. yeah it's terrible I mean it really does give off this sense this storyline of these spoiled privileged students who as much as that word is overused at the moment privilege but um you it's know, pretty some, apt here. I think yeah. <laughs> if it's out anywhere, a bunch of Cambridge students trying to get a port of fire is yeah. pretty privileged. Yeah, exactly. You know, for not, for thinking he has the wrong opinion, it's just yeah. it's so outrageous. Yeah. Arif Ahmed, who ran the free speech or was a big part of the campaign for the amended free speech policy here, which is much better. Um, you know, that was that was a case that he kind of was talking about during that during the campaign the Kevin Price camp um the Kevin Price case and about how you know we do have a problem if the university can't just say to these students who are acting like this actually just just stop like right. you're being childish and you're right you know you're you're in the wrong but there you go yeah yeah no I mean it's insane it's like here they are telling you you can't do this thesis on yeah. detransitioners and then they're just letting these other students run amok with this behavior that honestly may again like there are some things that should be disciplined right like yeah so it's pretty disturbing to see the the priorities there um yeah. what did you end up doing your thesis on by the way um surrogacy <laughs> oh <predictably>. okay <laughs> okay yeah um I was really lucky to get because in the end I had to do um I had to just pick um there's like a list of approved subjects that you can choose from if you're not allowed to do your personal project that you develop but um I managed to find the only one that had a radical feminist slant okay. um yeah I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be obviously I'm trying to be um not not necessarily objective because it's, it's qualitative research so subjectivity is you know is part of it but I'm trying maybe to draw on radical feminist theory as a resource without necessarily like imposing it onto the experiences of the surrogates and the and the people that I'm interviewing because I do think it's important kind of coming on from what we were saying earlier about finding a balance between using these ideologies as like a tool and as a way of understanding things that happen in the world but then also being able to take a step back from them and just um like interact or or perceive the people involved as as people mm -hmm. Yeah, and that kind of brings us to um, the name of your substack. So I'm going to get the Latin wrong, but Nihilus in Verbena? I think it's um, <laughs> Nihilus in Verba, though I, I never did Latin or anything, so I could be wildly mispronouncing it. Um, yeah, which means take no one's word for it or on no one's word, um, which I think comes down to us from Horace. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also the... It's also the official motto of the, the Royal Society, um, which is obviously a institution that was founded, I think, in like the late 18th, maybe the 19th century. Um, it's kind of the 
earliest sort of um, institution for scientific research that we have here in the UK, I think. Um, so I, I came across this idea in a lecture and it's I've become a bit obsessed with it, to be honest. So um, it's funny because I was just watching this uh, show, Neil deGrasse Tyson's show, and it's about the cosmos. It's called something to do with the cosmos. It's a really good show. And the third episode, they talked about the Royal Society and the that phrase, take no one's really? word for it in Latin. Yeah. So and I knew it. I knew it from you. So <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. So tell us more about what that phrase means to you. I think when I initially came across it, it was it was in an academic context and it was in the context of me being kind of a, a budding scientist, you know, even if that's not the direction I go in, um, that's how I'm trained, you know, as a psychologist in terms of the scientific method. Um, so in that context, take no one's word to it, words, take no one's word for it rather, is it's about looking at the data for yourself. It's about doing your own experiments. It's about kind of staying objective and um, not imposing your views on on the data as, as much as is humanly possible because there's always going to be an element of subjectivity um, and most of all it's about it's about not not just accepting the conclusions of others um, and rely, it's about relying on your own kind of empirical senses and, and on your own sense of logic and reason so that was that was the context in which it was presented to me and 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 in which I became really fond of it but I think it's something that resonates with me kind of more widely um when it comes to politics um you know even even in kind of relationships I think but especially in politics because like I say I grew up on Tumblr I grew up on these virtual spaces where there are certain dogmas um like for example trans women are women or sex work is work or whatever else that you're not you're not allowed to question um so I suppose for me it's an idea which in you know wraps up in a lovely little bit of pretentious latin which I can't <laughs> help but <laughs> I can't help but be drawn to um it's just about thinking for yourself I mean preamble aside it's it's just it's really just about thinking for yourself and not taking anything for granted. Yeah, it's funny because I was going to ask next, like, how does trans women or women come up against Nilius <laughs> and Verba, you know? Like, how does that phrase uh, clash with that concept? I'm, they're, just, they're just fundamentally incompatible because, I mean, trans women or women is, it's not an empirical statement. It's not based in... Um, you know what science would consider objective reality and it's not really based in subjective experience either I don't think because I mean we hear a lot that that trans women have the same experiences as women um but I don't accept that and I don't think you know and I I've never experienced a trans woman as a woman either which I know sounds really harsh and I wouldn't want to get into this whole literal thing violence actually just sorry kidding. I said it's literal violence actually <laughs> yeah just kidding. yeah <laughs> yeah no I'm I mean and I think I don't I don't want to um do the whole thing of you know there's no such thing as a trans woman who can pass or whatever because I don't want to get into commenting on appearances mm. or or sort of being superficial in that way but that said um there was a period of my life when I still believed all of the trans women are women stuff in theory, um, where I just wasn't interested in men because of various things that had that had happened to me um, and experiences that I'd had, and I was just dating women. Um, and I would go on, I would go on like Tinder and her and all of the other kind of um, dating apps for women. Um, and you'd get the kind of the token um, trans identifying men who were on these dating apps. And mm. I would look at their pictures and I would think this is internalized trans misogyny because that's the language that I was still thinking in. Um, that's not a woman would be my immediate response. 
and it didn't matter how much I tried to rationalize it and how much I stared at their faces and tried to find the little lever in my head that would make it click that they were women and therefore I don't know not a threat or whatever else um but I just I just couldn't see them as women and it didn't matter that it didn't matter that I that I kind of would say all of the right things if asked so I think so I think that's the thing is nullius in verba it's about I mean one of its aspects is empiricism and about you know your own empirical kind of observations and experience so there's just this kind of fundamental disconnect between between a mantra like trans women are women which is an attempt to construct reality through language not to describe it um and then nullius in verba which is just about describing reality and and trying to make sense of it yeah why do you think so many women say trans women are women i think it has a lot to do with the fact that we want to be nice and that that desire isn't it's it's sort of so ingrained um it's not it's not something we do it's almost something that we're taught to be like from a really young age to be accommodating to be kind um and I think also I mean this is a generalization but I think that women on the whole are really quite scared of of social rejection um I think, you know, I think there's probably a solid basis for that in terms of psychology and in terms of the way that girls interact differently from from quite a young age than than men do, where, you know, little girls and and adolescent girls, there's a lot more kind of um, relationships and and bullying and everything is a lot more kind of ephemeral and abstract, whereas with men, it's kind of, or boys, it's a lot more kind of, um, it's a lot more kind of physical and there's less focus on I don't know, on, on sort of accepting on, on language and on constructing different realities and everything. So, you know, I think maybe there's something in that, but most of all, it's just, it's just about being, it's just, it's just about being nice. I think we're just being imposed upon as a sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know from, I know in my experience, it was really that fear that I was doing literal violence. Um, and that's the kind of mode of discourse that we have now that language is right. violence. Right. So it's really hard to push back against that. And when I first started talking about JK Rowling and about this stuff, everything I said was prefaced by like, of course, trans women are women. Um, uh-huh. and of course, trans women are, um, I don't know, of course, trans women are the most marginalized group in society because I felt it was almost like a magic spell. Like I had yeah. to say that. It felt like I couldn't not say that because I'd be, I couldn't deal with the guilt of not saying it and then also criticizing. And eventually I think the guilt of diverging from that reality was always very present and there. Um, And it was just building and building. And I got to a point where I had to think, you know, either I I just say, you know, either I just accept that this reality isn't true and I liberate myself from that, or I need to, kind of get back in the box but I just couldn't get back in the box anymore at that point I think it was I'd just gone too far yeah so there was a certain point where your brain just rejected the the dissonance yeah Mm -hmm. I think you know I I started all of this stuff I started questioning assuming that it was possible to hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time and that for that to be okay you know I thought I could defend JK Rowling from misogyny while also defending trans women who I you know thought were the most persecuted minority ever um and I kind of assumed that other people thought that too but I think the reaction to me trying to speak or like question in good faith and and bias towards the um the reality that they wanted me to believe in anyway which is so intense and so vitriolic that it, it completely drove me away from it because yeah yeah it just became clear that yeah that dissonance and, and nuance and, and complexity isn't it can't be accommodated by this this kind of ideology yeah and I think it's so telling that it's people like you or like me who are you know enemy number one of the trans rights activists because 
we both, I mean, I can speak for me as like, you know, I'm willing to say she, her a lot of the time. I'm willing to use preferred pronouns, certainly use people's preferred names. Yeah. Um, I'm willing to maintain a level of fiction, right? Like yeah. that I always want more, more so back then. Mm. But even once I, once I had that like lever in my brain, not able to switch, right? Even then I was like, perfectly, it didn't, there was no animosity that came with that. There was no negative feelings whatsoever attached to it except when I learned that just by believing that I would be hated you know by the people around me by the peers around me or and maybe even the professors um so it was like okay so I'm perfectly happy to accept you as you are I've always been in favor of gender nonconformity, and but the fact that I know you're not like me which is really important, especially if you're becoming a feminist and you're learning about that. Like, well, that's really important to me that I'm a woman and that's not, and a man isn't a woman. That just by knowing that now people are gonna think it's okay to say that you should die or you should be raped or you should, you know, have your throat slit, like stuff that they say to say to Terps. Um, And that's really where I think people like us are like, well, no, we hang on. There's a problem here. We actually, now we really have to say that truth that trans women aren't women. Yeah, because I agree. I mean, I would have been, I would have been fine all of my life just, you know, saying she, her, Mm -hmm. um, using the right pronouns, being, you know, the, the right name and, and sort of being sensitive of, you know, triggering dysphoria. And I still am, you know, to, to, I think quite, a, a strong extent given that I am a radical feminist and everything um but it's become necessary they've made it necessary to be honest when I think it would be preferable for everyone if we could just be if we could just continue living in that kind of almost like an arranged fiction you know um, it, or at least it would be more comfortable. I think increasingly maybe it wouldn't be preferable because, you know, you, the problem with any level of fiction is, of course, then that you can't really get into the, the causes of anything or what's really going on or the mechanics yeah, of it. that's true. But you're right, though. It's, it's, it's really the, the reaction that you get just for questioning something even very slightly, not even... Right really diverging from the narrative that's accepted um that I think is a tipping point for for a lot of us and rightly so right certainly and then then once you realize that no one can change sex and and it's like I don't know I've spent a lot of time on this channel talking about science and why you can't change sex and that's all super important to talk about and actually quite interesting Mm -hmm. but um it's kind of intuitive though, that you can't change sex. I mean, you don't really need to know science, I don't think, to understand that you can't change sex, right? So uh, then once you once you see it, once you see that the emperor is naked, once you see that TWAW is a lie, you start seeing male pattern behavior, which does exist, um, yeah. of course, and so does female pattern behavior. Um, but we as women need to recognize male pattern behavior. And it's, you know, it's not sexist to say that we can be vulnerable sometimes. And I think you've been, you know, making this point in a lot of different ways, different illustrations. In some cases, this arranged fiction is is okay. But Mm -hmm. once you start seeing beyond the veil, you want to be able to talk about it and call it out. And then it's complete. And then you realize it's completely antithetical to feminism. Yeah, it's it's so difficult because I think, you know, I, I interact with quite a lot of um, like older transsexual women on Twitter who, you know, who are in bo- who are on board with, you know, gender critical kind of yeah. stuff and always have been and have never thought that they were anything else, um, you know, than, than the sex that they are, but who've just experienced extreme dysphoria for, you know, through enough of their life that they've made the decision for them that, the best decision is to is to transition which is obviously very drastic but you know they're adults when they did it they did it and they seem to be happy and like I you know I I'm so fine with saying she her in those cases because Mm -hmm. almost because you know that that person is acknowledging implicitly or otherwise that you know that it is an arranged fiction you're not playing into someone's delusion you're just kind of 
you you know yeah you're just kind of being you're just kind of being respectful of that person and 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 then their almost their medical need in that moment Mm -hmm. but but the problem is I think that those people get hurt by all of the the more extreme stuff because afterwards you know I'm spending time going around saying trans women aren't women and actually laboring this point and it's just so unnecessary for I think those those transsexual women or or trans women or whatever you want to call it I the ter- I, the terminology is so complex now I think because we're fighting against a an ideology which is based on constructing reality through language I like I I spend so much time now thinking about my own language in opposition to that and trying not to play into it and it's just it's just exhausting yeah Sorry, that's a tangent. No, it is. It's exhausting. I had a really funny thing that felt so ironic that I was in correspondence with a medical student here. And I'm hoping this person will still um, answer some questions that my followers had for this, but they're completely anonymous. So I'm going to say the pronoun they. So the mm-hmm. irony here is that I know this person's sex because I FaceTimed with them, but um, I can't reveal it. I mean, I don't want to reveal their identity. I'm, I'm keeping them anonymous because I know how, how unsafe that is um, for, for their career. But the irony is that I'm now using the um, grammatically incorrect singular <laughs> they for an individual, which, okay, whatever, we could change. Gram- grammar rules can change. That's not my core issue with it, although it is incorrect you know, to use singular they when you know the person's sex, right? But now yeah. I'm doing it because to keep them safe. It's so ironic yeah. from the queer theorists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing, I guess, is I think I've probably at least three times in this conversation told you something where I've had to keep someone anonymous or like not mm-hmm. go give away too many details. Yeah. So then you're using, like you say, you're using different pronouns or ugh, trying to be mindful of pronouns or, or whatever else, even mm-hmm. when they're not even trans. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And it was to your, to your to another point you just made, I just heard an interview with Buck Angel, who's a trans man and very much uh, aware of all this stuff and very outspoken and supportive of women like us. And um, Buck was saying that he's never had, and I do want to use his preferred pronouns, you know, he and he looks like a man and he it's I'm perfectly willing and happy to like, respect how he wants to be seen. Um, but he um, And he said, I've never had to acknowledge so many times and so often my sex and my, the, the, my history that I kind of, it's just behind me. Like, yes, of course I'm female biologically and I was born female and all that stuff. And that because of this new trans activism, he's never had to like harp on that so much. Yeah. People kind of got it before. Like he, you know, what he is, what he is. And he could kind of just move on and live. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's completely counterintuitive the whole thing and I think it just probably speaks to the fact that I mean I don't know what people's intentions are and I don't want to assume that they're not good you know the people who are involved in this but I don't think I don't think that you know the students here who are so invested in this ideology even if they're partially doing it because they genuinely believe that using the right language or whatever will decrease violence in some mysterious way out there in the real world um I don't think it's it's not it's not political activism in the way that we traditionally think of political activism as being there's kind of an investment in it that isn't healthy because it's one thing being passionate about a cause because the cause matters and because there are concrete changes that can be made through your actions and through your thinking about something and um and trying to change and trying to change things um but then it's another thing almost feeding off something um feeding off like the controversy around it or the the ability to abuse people with impunity if they said the wrong thing or whatever else it it just there's something so deeply sinister about it all and I'm 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 exhausted, but also very ready to to keep doing this for as long as necessary. 
Yeah, that's so true about these, the, this power dynamic. So yeah, how, what do you make of that, um, that element of it, the, the, the power here? And you know, like we see the power of the students over someone like a porter, the power of men over women, the power of people to silence us or to try to silence us. Yeah, how do you see that playing into this? I think from the radical feminist perspective, um, Julie Bindle the other night when I, I chaired an event on a Q&A with her, she was saying, I think, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, you know, whenever progress has been made in feminism, there's been a backlash. Um, and I think there's probably an element of that in the kind of visceral response to, you know, to women saying no now and to kind of refusing and also you know to men who are refusing to kind of go along with um the accepted narrative but I don't think that's all it is either I think really it comes from this might sound odd given that we've been talking about power and privilege but I think it really comes from this kind of sense of helplessness um because I think we're all aware that the world is basically on fire like everything is a mess I mean not to not to be kind of massively reductive because you know actually we've made huge gains as a civilization in the last um you know couple of centuries and things are better than they've ever been and, and all of that but we're so I think that we're so um connected to everywhere around the world in terms of social media and in terms of tv and journalism and stuff we know so much that is going wrong um, beyond just our own personal problems and there's also all of this pressure placed on us increasingly I think by the fact that you know we live in a capitalistic consumerist society to think that we can fix the world in terms of what we consume so I mean like not eating palm oil or like I'm a vegan and and kind of I try and do stuff like that um the per person the personal is really political in kind of like modern politics. It's about the choices you make every day. Um, but actually we know that it's, I mean, to take the example of palm oil, not eating, me not eating palm oil isn't going to save the world. We need corporations to stop ripping down the Amazon. And yet we still feel like there's this pressure on us. So well, that's the only power we have as individuals is as consumers. And so I think there's, I think that kind of plays into the politics we've been talking about, um, about kind of fear of language and, and thought and everything, because I think it's, we think that our power politically is in terms, not only of the products that we consume, but in terms of the, the ideas that we consume and the ones that we produce and put out there and endorse. Um, so we're kind of pouring all of our energy into doing this, but at the same time, it's it's actually the structural stuff that affects people's lives, not whether you use the right pronouns, really. Um, yeah. So I think it's this weird, par what's the word? Paradox or oxymoron or something between between the fact that, I mean, we're incredibly privileged as a generation, certainly the students at Cambridge, including me, um, and at the same time, we're kind of powerless. And I think there's a lot of frustration about that powerlessness that then gets channeled into this kind of really regressive approach to politics. That's really interesting. And I think maybe we could pick that up if you were willing to come back for a part two. I feel like I could go on. And that especially sparks a lot of things. You know, a lot of times the, the explanation offered for all this obsession with identity is at the detriment of all other, you know, politics, like you're saying, is um, the explanation given is that the young people who are doing it don't have a struggle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is true. And that's part of it. And I definitely agree, you need a struggle in your life. And if you don't have one, you'll, you'll make one. But at the same time, I have seen people, I mean, I have an acquaintance who's all in on queer theory, but he's been through like, homelessness and he's been incredibly downtrodden he's from a very vulnerable population of uh undocumented immigrants so yeah. um but he's all in on the queer theory like all in so um yeah so i'm wondering about that the complexity of that and i think that would be another really interesting 
conversation with you, hopefully. But um, Sophie, it was great to get to hear from you. And where can people find you online? Um, I'm on at psychology at Twitter, like psychology and then Sophie. It's a stupid pun. Um, <laughs> and I mean, please also do follow us, um, the Cambridge Radical Feminist Network. We're at Cam Radfems on, I think, everything. We're on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. And um, if you want to hear more from me occasionally when I can um, fit it in between my my uni work and everything, um, I do write on Nullius in Verba on Substack. So, and we're been... hoping to get some of some articles from Sophia up on Plebity at some point in the future because <laughs> I've asked you to write for us to, if you want. Um, and also, I forgot to actually talk about the Cambridge RadFem networks, but do you want to briefly <laughs> tell people what to look out for and what, what events they might be interested in? Sure. Um, so this week, so we're, we're running a, a series of six lectures, um, replatforming deplatformed women. So taking um, women who've been no platformed in the past um, or lost work or whatever else from um, due to their gender critical or their radical feminist views and we're kind of replatforming them virtually. So this week was Julie Bindle talking on faux feminism, how men, how feminism for men took over the academy. That's available on our YouTube if you missed it. Um, next week we're hearing from Professor Joe Phoenix talking about her prisons research and the conservative politics of self ID. And then later on we've got Selena Todd, um, Kathleen Stock, Rachel Ara, and Maya Forstater. So please do tune in for all of that. We're really hoping it will be a success. Excellent, it sounds wonderful. I think a lot of people will be really excited about it. So thank you so much, Sophie. This was really fun. Thank you. And yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. It's been great.